Today, we are going to discuss the concept of mind in Upanishads. This is in connection with uh, the thesis of transcendental mind that Upanishadic concept of mind also argues for a transcendental theory of mind. Now, this transcendental thesis is indeed quite different from the kind of uh, philosophical theory about mind that we are going to discuss in our later lectures. But it is very important to talk about the Upanishadic concept of mind precisely because in this thesis we find that there is a dichotomy between the soul and the mind. There is indeed no dichotomy between the body and the mind. So, in fact the transcendental thesis argues that there is a harmony between mind, body and the soul. So, what kind of presuppositions that the Upanishads make in order to talk about the concept of mind is something very significant. I think we can discuss this in connection with a Plato's notion of mind in connection with the transcendental thesis that has been argued by the platonic philosophers of mind. As I mentioned earlier, this notion of transcendental is very much part of the epistemic discourse of the concept of mind. How does one know the mind? How does one comprehend the reality that this reality is one and not two? So, this has been the basic question in philosophy of mind. As I also have pointed out that the transcendental thesis talks about the metaphysics of mind. There is a mind which is a metaphysically real. So, what kind of metaphysics Upanishads talk about in connection with the study of reality? We shall try to explore these questions today. Now, when we talk about reality, when we talk about the creation of the reality, one goes to the cosmology, the cosmological viewpoint that has been put forward by the Upanishads. In Upanishad, there is a concept called Hiranmaya Garva. The reality has evolved from this notion called Hiranmaya Garva. In Chandogya Upanishad, there is a debate between Udhalaka and Swataketu. Swataketu is interested to know that how the reality has been conceptualized, how the reality has come into being and Udhalaka his father tries to explain to Swetaketu that this reality, if at all there is a reality, then this reality has not come from a non-being. How can something be called real and it can come from a non-being? So, therefore, there is some truth behind the existence of the reality. So, there is a being okay, and he gives an example of this that can we conceptualize the notion of a port, can we conceptualize the notion of a port when we say that there is no clay 
out of which the port is made. So, when we talk about something say x and x is a port and x is made out of something. So, therefore, when you talk about a reality as a whole, we need to talk about the being and this being might have caused the existence of the reality. Now, this debate about the being as the cause of reality is there in Chandogya Upanishad. But what is interesting is the epistemic exercise that one undertakes in order to know what is the true nature of reality. So, the, it is the epistemological question which has been significantly addressed in Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, where there is a debate between Yajnavalaka and Maitri. Maitri is asking about the wealth. She says, what is that? And by possessing that, I can live a peaceful life. Now, Agyamalaka tries to address this question with reference to various things. And Agyamalaka says, by possessing this material wealth, you cannot live a happy life. So, the ultimate happiness that has been discussed in this epistemic discourse of knowing the self is something very significant. That how does one understand its own being and by knowing the being one lives a immortal happy life, a very blissful life. Maitreyi was interested to attend that bliss. Maitreyi was not certainly interested to possess the material wealth, because she knew that by possessing this wealth, she will not gain the happiness that she is aspiring to realize. So, Maitri's aspiration was to bring to us a theme that is the notion of immortality of self, the self which is infinite and more immortal is possessed by me and how does me realize that? Here is an infinite principle and I must know what I possess. So, that is what is the debate, that is what is an epistemic debate, which is there between Yajnavalaka and Maitre. So, when we talk about the existence of being, we see that we are all embodied being. The being has the soul which is immortal, infinite and the being also has a body. Now, therefore, I am an embodied being, but how does one understand the identity, the harmonious existence, the harmony that is there between these two and where we can locate mind? Is mind a sense organs or is mind something spiritual and Descartes would argue, 
because the western notion of dualism suggests to us that mind is a spiritual entity. Whereas, the Upanishadic concept of mind advocates that mind is not a spiritual entity, rather mind is one of the sense organs that is what is called Sukhma Sarira. So, there are two varieties of Sariras, one is the Sthula Sarira and another is the Sukhma Sarira, the subtle existence of the body is something one need to understand. When you talk about the mind, we must talk about its subtle existence. And when we talk about the gross existence of the body, we need to see how the body is been operated, how the body is functional. It is functional with the help of various indriyas. Mana is an indriya. So, mana is different from atman which is a soul okay. and we need to locate, we need to study what kind of relationship exists and that binds all three things atman mind or manas and sarira the body. The soul, the mind and the body are all connected. So, the kind of connection which probably is uh, presupposed in Spinoza. So, for example, who is one of the Cartesian philosophers of mind where Spinoza talks about the pre established harmony, the harmony between the soul and the body. When you talk about an embodiment, we need to also look at this harmony existence. So, let us study in detail what is this notion of Atman and what do we locate the concept of Atman? Is Atman is a kind of an evolute or is mind an evolute or mind is just a mysterious entity? We need to study in detail. Now, let us talk about Atman, the notion of self or Atman is nothing but a conscious being, the self is a conscious being and this self is also a transcendental reality. So, self is conscious and self is transcendental. Now, as a conscious being, we need to locate what is the role of consciousness. So, therefore, there is a cognitive or a psychological function involved when you talk about consciousness. And there is also a moral function involved, because the consciousness or chetana has been associated with the notion of agency. That me as an agent acting in the world, the engagement between the self and the world would presuppose some kind of a normative function that the engagement is regulated by a moral principle, a normative principle. So, that is what we need to look at and we also need to look at that it is a conscious principle, it is a self reflexive principle, a principle which realizes that what is it? Is it good or bad? So, that kind of self recognition of one's own action is important when we talk about the agency or when you talk about 
the self. So, self has two aspects, the psychological aspects and what kind of psychology Upanishads teach us and what kind of morality they also teach us. We need to look at that. Now, when we talk about consciousness, when say for example, Uddhalaka is explaining to Svetaketu that from the being everything has come into existence. Now, what is that being which Uddhalaka is conceptualizing here? Udalaka certainly conceptualizing about a reality which is pure consciousness and the Upanishadic notion of consciousness refers to Brahman, the notion of Brahman. Okay. Now, what is Brahman? It is a Prakasa Swarupa, as I have mentioned here, it is a Prakasa Swarupa, Brahman or a self effulgent being. It is immortal, eternal and infinite. This prakasa, it is a yoti swaru. It has no existence within space and time. It is beyond space and time and therefore, it is transcendental. So, and Brahman acts as a metaphysical principle. So, the ultimate metaphysical principle that can explain the nature of reality in Upanishads refers to the existence of Brahman and Brahman is a pure consciousness. Now, I will talk about the mind little later. Now, what kind of relationship this Brahman and Atman are having? As I mentioned, Brahman is consciousness, Atman is also conscious, Atman is also immortal and Atman is also eternal and finite. Atman cannot be located in space and time not to be understood in terms of any binary categories. Say for example, when we talk about binary categories, we refer to that Brahman is a kind of a universal whole and Atman is a part of it, Brahman is very vast and Atman is just a tiny aspect of the Brahman. So, these kind of binaries are not applicable to Brahman Atman relationship. And it is not identical with human bodies. If you say that is it identical with human bodies, it is a product of human bodies. Now, what kind of existence the Atman would have when we suggest that it is we are an embodied being? Upanishads would argue that Atman and the soul is not identical with the body. Soul is a kind of a nirafaksha drasta. Okay. It is a witness consciousness. In Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, there is an allegory, allegory about two birds, where these two birds represent the two aspects of the self, two aspects of the consciousness, or we can say two kinds of consciousness. One kind of consciousness talks about our engagement with the world. You see, one bird is pecking the those fruits, trying to eat those fruits. Another bird is just looking at the outside world, just gazing. It is mere spectator. And that is why I, I said it is a drasta. It is a nirapeksha drasta in the sense that it is it has this power of witnessing, but this witness is not an involved witness, not an intentional witness. He is just an onlooker who is witnessing things as they are happening before him. So, the bird which represents the state of an onlooker, a disinterested looker suggests that the soul is just an witnessing principle. Whereas, there is another aspect to this consciousness, as I said soul is conscious, 
So, there is another aspect to this consciousness. This consciousness is about the a very engagement of an agent who is interacting with the world. Okay. So, how does one transcend this engagement is important. So, the Upanishadic psychology would suggest the method of transcending from the physical interaction with the world or the intentional interaction with the world, okay. transcending from the actions karma and realize what you are. That is what is the message. We one need to realize the essential identity between Jiva and Atman. So, there are two things. One, I am a Jiva Purus. I am a Jiva Purus in the sense that I am a living being and all living beings are the manifestations of the Brahman and being a living being, I have this power of interacting with the world. So, I have the power of interacting with the world, but when I interact with the world, I may not realize what I am doing, I may be just doing, I may not understand the consequence of my interaction through the performance of various actions. So, that is what is the epistemic aspect of it. So, when does one realize that I am not supposed to be just engaged with the world? When does one withdraw from this engagement? Now, this withdrawal is important and that is what is the moral significance of the Upanishadic notion of consciousness. And the drill is about transcending. How does the jiva comprehend or grasp that this engagement is not a real engagement? The real engagement is what it should have with Atman or the soul. So, that essential identity between Jiva and Atman is something what you call the true knowledge, what Upanishad says Tattvam Mashi. The ardent epistemic exercise is to know to at that, I am that. So, that is to be known and that is to be known not through my sense experiences. My sense organs would not help me to understand what it is, but of course, my sense organs would help me when I am engaged with this world. So, Atman is not an object of my perception, it cannot be an object of my perception. Whatever can be an object of my perception are given, it is outside me. Okay. Now, what is that me? then the me is that which is inside. So, there is an interiority to this experience and there is an exteriority to this experience. So, this internal external debate that you would find in the western philosophy of mind is something very significant with reference to this Upanishadic notion of self and the experience of the self. When the being experiences his own true nature that refers to the interiority of one's experience. So, therefore, consciousness has been self reflexive. When you say consciousness is self reflexive, it reflects on its own being. Try to understand what is it. So, there is an it is not that this direction, this intentional engagement is just always from mind, what we call mind to 
the world, they are all intentionally connected, but there is also a kind of intentionality which is directed towards its own existence. Okay. So, it is that kind of intentional directedness provides us some kind of an epistemic structure, what you call the structure of interiority as intentionality which is directed towards the world provides us a kind of an epistemic intentional structure in which one is engaged with the world and tries to understand the content of this engagement etcetera etcetera. So, that is what you know something interesting. Now, why one has to know what Swate Ketu who is an interested learner, who is a jigyasu like Maitreyi and Uddalaka and Agyamalaka are trying to explain to this jigyasu. Now, unless you are an interested knower, unless you have this jigyasa, unless you have this jigyasa to know what is truth as Socrates said, Aristotle is trying to address this, one must have desire to know what it is. That is the fundamental primary principle which Aristotle is talking about. Similarly, the Upanishadic concept of mind tries to emphasize this aspect of knowing and the act of knowing is that one must be interested to know, one must be willing to know what it is. Maitri was willing to know what is that immortality and the power of immortality by possessing which she would have lived a very blissful life, happy life. So, the kind of a, the finest perfect well being that Maitri was trying to conceptualize, Amartya Sen has discussed about it. Now, Similarly, Swetakati was interested to know from his father Uddalaka that what is that reality which has created the existence of this entire cosmos or what is that reality which is responsible for the existence of this entire cosmos. Certainly, Uddalaka was trying to explain the metaphysical principle and this metaphysical principle needs to be grasped, it needs to be comprehended through consciousness, because it is not part of the sense organs. It cannot be derived through this kind of a Indriyana Sannikarsa Ganamutpan that the interaction with the sense organs with the world from which this kind of knowledge does not arise. Hence, we need to talk about this kind of a hidden reality. It is always hidden that self which is and disinterested onlooker is not directly given to me, it is a hidden reality and I need to unfold its shades, I need to remove the valves and see its existence. That seeing is seeing through experiences and this experience is directed towards the inner form of reality, because the truth is, the truth is not an external one, it is something internal, anuha, one has to realize that. So, that is why we need to talk about a kind of a reflexive mode of consciousness, a consciousness which is directed towards its own reality and we need to look at that. Now, I have also talked about this notion of a harmony, kind of a harmonious coexistence between jivas and atman, because the harmony has to be there between finite and the infinite, when they are qualitatively different. We need to talk about the relationship and as I said, one must realize their coexistence. Now, this realization is something important and that comes through 
the act of knowing. As I said, the desire to know, one has to be a jigyansu to know. Then it is very interesting to talk about this field of knowing. The field is an infinite field. When you talk about Brahman, okay, a kind of a consciousness, which is a kind of a pure consciousness and it has an infinite potential and Atman is a part of Brahman or Atman is like Brahman. As I said, we need to talk about the reality not in terms of binaries. So, therefore, try to understand that Atma is a Sarupa of and this Sarupa is a Jyotir Sarupa of this pure consciousness. So, it is the soul or the Atman is also infinite, eternal and not bound by space and time. So, the soul is not part of the world, Jagat. It is not the part of the world. Then, when we talk about knowing or the act of knowing, the soul creates its own field. Now, this debate between debate of Khetra and Khetragya, I said just a few minutes before that the intentionality creates a kind of an epistemic structure and this epistemic intentional structure of knowledge is what I call Khetra. As a Karta, I am performing karma action and these actions are intentional actions. Perception is intentional, my saying is in intentional, my experiencing is also intentional, experiencing of all the things which is given to me are also intentional. This in the act of intentionality forms some kind of a intentional epistemic structure. It is a kind of an intentional epistemic structure. Similarly, when I try to know about my own self, which talks about the interiority of my experience, I am talking about also another kind of an epistemic structure. Okay. Now, what is significant is this that this epistemic structure per se constitute what we call Khetra, the field of knowledge. And Khetragya is the person who is involved in this act of knowing. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about this that there is a field in which the agent is interacting with the world, and there is also an agent who is trying to know what one is doing. He is this knower is a Khetragya. So, the Khetragya is bound by this normative principle that he must know what is reality, what is its true identity, what is its being a Khetragya must know and therefore, as a knower of the field, he tries to realize what is truth, whether its engagement with the world or Jagat is truth will give him knowledge or the engagement with or the withdrawal or try to understand what is the limitation of this engagement how far this knowledge are tenable. So, understanding the limitation itself will talk about maybe there is an infinite. So, that mode of engagement will talk about a kind of the infinite possibilities of knowing. Knowledge itself is infinite and there must be an infinite possibilities of knowing. Okay? So, the Brahman as a universal field includes everything 
and one who understands that everything is one and there is no difference between them. Everything is created by one. One understands all the qualities of, one understands the commonality between them. Then one does not find any distinction between you and me, higher and lower, poor and this thing, rich. One does not really differentiate between the pain and the non pain situations, the suffering and the bliss, everything is one, okay. everything is evolving from one or has evolved from one and everything is merging into the one. So, that realization okay, or a knowledge is something significant when we talk about the infinite possibilities of knowing. Now, why one should know? Because you are the Amrutasya Putra, you are the, the Jiva as a the son of immortality must have this desire to know. We are not just simple being, you are Amrutasya Putra. So, then the Jiva must know its true nature in the sense that what is that immortality of its being. To understand that we need to talk about the harmony between Atman, Manas and Sarira and how the Sarira and the Mana are coordinated. We need to look at that. So, as I, as I said about Sariras, it is the totality of the sense organs, gross as well as the subtle sense organs. Now, when you talk about subtle sense organs, which is a Mana, I mean it performs various activities thinking, experiencing, remembering, knowing etcetera, but it is not the instrument of pleasure and lust, rather it is for spiritual realization. Remember the Upanishadic notion of body is not supposed to be engaged with pleasure, no, because pleasure is not a reality, because the body is to be seen as a kind of a spiritual field. The body itself is a Khatra and the Atman which is residing in the body is a Khatragya. So, therefore, the Khatragya must understand the true nature of the bodies, understand what is the Swarupa of all these Indriyas, in what way they function and how their functions can be controlled and how one can overcome the limitations of this functions. So, when this engagement is significantly addressed, the body is no more a kind of a space for the attainment of pleasure. No, body is therefore, a space for realizing or understanding what is spiritually significant. So, that is what is a kind of a normativity which we need to address to. So, the Atman Brahman coordination as Pradhan defines I quote the finite mind is capable of receiving the experience, but cannot conceptualize them without the soul which is the seat of thinking and the other creative activities. So, when we talk about creative activities of the mind we really refer to the soul, not the mind, because mind is an indriya, mana is an indriya, it is a subtle sense organ. Okay. And what are its function? Look at this allegory of a chariot in Kathopanishadas. I have also mentioned about this allegory of a chariot with reference to Plato and Pradhan says, I quote, in a famous allegory of the chariot, the soul is the owner of the chariot, the intellect is the charioteer, the mind, the reins, the sense organs, the horse and the body, the chariot. So, in Kathopanishad, this allegory is very significantly explained that each one of them has a function 
okay, and we need to locate the coordination between them. We need to locate the relation between them. Then only we will understand their normative significance. Otherwise, we cannot. So, the dualism that has been proposed here is not the kind of dualism which has been conceptualized in the kind of a western philosophical scenario. Rather, the Upanishadic dualism is a dualism between the soul and the mind and the sarira, the body. The Upanishadic mind is not spiritual as in Descartes and other dualist thinkers. Here, the mind is a subtle organ of the physical type and is taken as a part of the subtle body called Sukhma Sarira. The soul is categorically different from the body and the mind. It is being of the nature of consciousness, Pragyanam Brahma. The mind is proximate to the soul, but it is cannot be identified with the soul. Therefore, mind must remain within the physical limits, though it can aspire to get closer to the soul. So, the mind soul reality, the mind and the soul, they are nearer to each other, but one cannot talk about a kind some kind of a identity between them. Now, when somebody in proximity with the other, one tries to understand its true nature. The soul takes over, soul has control over the entire function of what you called the chariot, the reins and the charioteer, the intellect and the honor of the chariot. And that honor, the presupposition of an honor is a metaphysical presupposition. It is a normative presupposition. So, hence the kind of dichotomy one finds in western philosophical scenario is not available here, because mind is not really a spiritual entity, okay, as it has been understood by Descartes and the other Cartesians. Now, look at how it has been explained. It has been explained with reference to the Panchakosas in Taitreya Upanishad, but then refers to the five Seths, which talks about the evolutionary aspect of the reality. It starts with Annamaya at the bottom level and it goes upward. So, it is kind of a bottom up relationship, this evolution is always a kind of a bottom up relationship. Annamaya kosha, the bodily self, the pranamaya kosha, manamaya kosha, vijnanamaya kosha and anandamaya kosha. The anandamaya kosha is a kosha which talks about the set of bliss, vijnanamaya where we talk about intellect, consciousness, manamaya which we talk about the mental which is a sense organs, Sukhma Indriya, Pranamaya Kosha, where we talk about life, which Aristotle talks about the principle of life, Annamaya Kosha, which is we talk about the bodily self. So, these are different layers, goes from bottom to off. So, this is a kind of evolution is always a kind of an upward, evolution always represents some kind of an upward movement. Okay. Now, what is this evolutionary process? Pradhan says, I quote, from the body life evolves, from life the mind, from the mind consciousness, from consciousness the supra consciousness state of bliss. And that is what Maitri was trying to understand, that is what Swetaketu was trying to understand or attain the state of bliss. So, in this scheme of things, neither the body nor the mind nor the Atman can be dissociated from one another, they are found as the totality. So, it is the totality as a whole which represents the reality and it is the totality is the manifestation of this metaphysical principle called Brahman or consciousness. To know what it is, one must transcend these layers of existence from Annamaya to Anandamaya Kosha, that is the 
the finest state of the existence of being. Thank you.